Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here today on behalf of the Executive Board of Erasmus University. We are especially delighted to welcome Professor Van Dam, his family, colleagues, and of course also his students. Professor Van Dam will deliver his inaugural lecture this afternoon, confirming his special appointment as Professor of International Business and Human Rights. Right. This chair was established and endowed by the Foundation for Peace Sciences and Amnesty International in the Netherlands. Professor Kees van Dam has returned to his alma mater. Though we assume that as a first-year student at our university, Kees van Dam did not envisage that he would once enter the auditorium as a leading scientist within his field. He finalized his degree in law in Utrecht, where in 1989 he received his Master of Laws. In the last decennia, Kees van Dam has made a considerable contribution to his chosen professional field. Among other many activities worth mentioning, he devoted his considerable abilities to the court in Arnhem and the Ministry of Justice. During his time at the ministry, he was a member of several Dutch delegations participating in international meetings of the OECD, European Nations, and United Nations. During his time in London, he worked with the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. It was in London where he established himself as an independent legal counselor. The universities of Utrecht, the Free University of Amsterdam, the Queen Mary University of London and King's College students were given the opportunity to emerge themselves in the extensive knowledge and expertise of the lecturer Van Dam. His expertise focuses on Dutch private law, European le legislation, European treaties and human rights, comparative law and cultural diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Van Dam is exceptionally well suited to hold the chair international business and human rights and without any doubt will make a substantial contribution to education and research of international entrepreneurship and human rights. Erasmus University Rotterdam is grateful to the Foundation for Peace Sciences and Amnesty International in the Netherlands for the establishment of the endowment of this chair at the Rotterdam School of Management. This chair and its teaching principles will focus on the all-important interaction between business and society and will maintain a close dialogue with the Department Business Society Management where it is based. With this chair, the Rotterdam School of Management also emphasizes the importance our university gives to the promotion of social sensitivity and corporate social responsibility. Dear Professor Van Dam, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to the academic community of Erasmus University Rotterdam. I have complete confidence that you will uphold and honor the core values of our university, precision, reliability, accountability, impartiality, and autonomy. I look forward to hearing your speech entitled, and entitled Enhancing Human Rights Protection, a, a company lawyer's business. Professor Van Dam, the floor is yours. Mr. Director Magnificus, ladies and gentlemen, it's just past four o'clock, and in England this means it's tea time. It's at this time of the day, the quintessential English question is, 
how would you like your tea? And my answer then is, a bit of sweat is fine, but I prefer it without blood and tears. A report published by the Columbia Law School last year revealed inhumane and abusive working and living conditions throughout the tea industry. Last week, the BBC published the shocking results of an investigation into the working and living conditions on tea estates in Assam, India. Houses in the, on the estates are in terrible despair, with leaking roofs and damp and cracked walls. Many families don't have, don't have a toilet. Workers earn around two-thirds of the minimum wage, and the levels of malnutrition are very high, high even by India's woeful standards. This is the cause for fatal diseases such as diarrhea, tuberculosis, and meningitis. Workers spray chemicals without protection, and on some estates, young children were found working. How did the industry respond to the BBC report? The owner of the plant said it was working hard to improve living and working conditions, and it also said that its membership of the Ethical Tea Partnership demonstrated its commitment to improving conditions in the tea industry. The Rainforest Alliance, the ethical certification organization, provided tea from this estate with a frog seal, assuring that the tea is produced using environmentally and socially responsible practices. In response to the BBC report, the Rainforest Alliance admitted our auditing process rests on an annual inspection, so it's not going to be perfect. A local NGO campaigning to improve conditions on the tea estates told the BBC that he believes the Rainforest Alliance's logo is more about selling tea than about empowering workers. Unilever also sources tea from these estates, such as for its Lipton brand. It says it takes the issues seriously, but that progress has been made and that it is working with its suppliers to achieve responsible and sustainable practices. The responses all sound like yesterday, suddenly something went wrong on the tea estates. In fact, the poor living and working conditions on these estates are structural and have been known and documented for a long time. In fact, nothing much has changed since colonial times. This example illustrates that, in the first place, that company uh, responses are almost identical. It looks like they all bought the same PR do-it-yourself kit. Second, ethical partnerships of companies may not be as ethical as their names suggest. And third, ethical certification organizations may in fact be a sham. However, the case may also be an illustration of something else. An increasing number of businesses understand that it is no longer enough to release a worn-off PR statement, but that they need to develop and implement a proper human rights policy. Therefore, it is important to look also behind this story. The story illustrates the challenges and dilemmas companies face when implementing their human rights policies, particularly when the local government is not willing to introduce and maintain a proper legal framework and is therefore part of the problem rather than the solution. And it may very well be possible that one or more of these companies genuinely want to do the right thing, but have only just begun or are not quite there. These companies are in transition on their way to improve and strengthen their human rights policies. Such learning organizations need to be looked at differently than organizations that are unwilling to learn. These are some challenges and dilemmas of international business and human rights in a nutshell, or rather in a teacup. The challenges and dilemmas of international business and human rights are the themes for this special chair. And for me, the challenge is also to work as a lawyer in a business school. Last year, I attended the annual conference of the European International Business Academy in Uppsala, in Sweden. Out of 400 participants, I was the only lawyer. 
I had landed in a community that spoke an academic language I had difficulties to understand. I felt like an Englishman in New York. I felt like an alien, a legal alien. So to be sure this was not going to happen today, I invited a lot of my lawyer friends to attend this inaugural lecture. Thank you all so much for coming along. For this chair, I look at themes on the crossroads of human rights and international business from my expertise and perspective as a lawyer. One of these themes is the role of a company's legal department in developing and implementing the company's human rights policies and practices. The perceived perception is that when it comes to human rights policies, the legal department of a company is cautious, limiting such policies, controlling them, and sometimes even obstruct them. This may cause tensions within the company and may negatively affect the company's internal alignment as well as the narrative that it would like to get across with its human rights policy. On the other hand, there are also examples where the initiative, the design, and the implementation of the company's human rights policy came from the legal department. The role of legal, or legal department, which I also call, call legal or company lawyer, is of particular importance because of the legal environment of international business and human rights is changing. A decade ago, 20 years ago, corporate social responsibility could be seen as a voluntary activity aimed at protecting the company's reputation. It was aimed at doing more than the law requires. The companies enforced their own corporate or industry codes. From this perspective, legal could play a defensive role, reining in policies that were too ambitious or created legal risks. This picture is changing. Legal rules with respect to human rights are becoming increasingly relevant for a company. In 2011, four years ago, the United Nations adopted the principle that businesses must respect human rights. This means that businesses must conduct human rights due diligence and provide a remedy for victims of human rights violations. These are so-called soft law obligations. This means that if a company does not comply with these rules, it will not face legal consequences. A victim cannot invoke these obligations in a court of law and states cannot fine the company in case it doesn't comply. However, even though there is no legal sanction, there can be many other consequences for a company that doesn't comply with these soft law obligations. I will come back to this, to this in a moment. More recently, also hard law appeared on the business and human rights stage. There are obligations that can be legal, these are obligations that can be legally enforced, that can be invoked by victims in a claim for damages or in, by the state if the company doesn't comply with the rules. The European Union and the United States are increasingly imposing obligations on companies to report about their human rights policies and practices. The United Nations is currently discussing a binding treaty on business and human rights. And individual European countries are issuing legislation or plan legislation in the area of business and human rights. It would be too simplistic to say that we are moving from voluntariness through soft law to hard law. Clearly, hard law will become more important, but it is not expected to completely replace the soft law rules anytime soon. Legislation and litigation are crucial instruments to deal with companies that do not take human rights seriously. And it is of pivotal importance that these instruments are further strengthened so that they can be more effective and victims can get redress for human rights violations. It is, however, an illusion to think that hard law can do the job of protecting human rights, not only because it will take a long time to have legislation in place, if ever, and human rights victims cannot wait that long, but also because legislation and litigation often do not really solve the actual problem let alone that they solve the underlying structural problems that are often complex and wide-ranging. So in business and human rights, we have a diverse legal framework 
of voluntary self-regulation, soft law, and hard law. And this framework will continue to change, probably with a growing emphasis on hard law instruments. Every lawyer will agree that human rights are a company lawyer's business. But the key question is, how does he engage with the company lawyers, with the company's human rights policy? How does he see his role? Does he resist, control, facilitate, or support the company human rights policy? In order, to, in order to make this more visible, I'm developing a framework consisting of features belonging to various levels of engagement. For this purpose, I am building on the transition phases model of my learned and honorable colleague, Bob van Tulder. And this model serves two purposes. First, it enables comparison of the various ways in which a legal department can perform in companies. This is a static function. Second, it also has a dynamic function in that it shows various phases of growing commitment of legal with the com company's uh, human rights policies. How it may have changed in the past, how it can change for the better, and eventually perhaps become a force for good. Here's the first draft of that. Four phases are distinguished in this model. An active, a reactive, an act sorry, an inactive, reactive, active, and proactive phase. They belong to different business orientations. They're in the, first, in the second line. An internally oriented business, a business that is reactive to external stakeholders, an active business that is internally oriented, and a proactive business that is externally oriented. On the second line, you will find the business attitude. The attitude of the inactive and reactive businesses is doing no harm to the company. An active business pledges to do no harm to the company and to others. This means that others, like workers, consumers, communities, are a pivotal part of the business model. And the proactive business is characterized by a positive aim, which is to do good to others. And this basically means empowering others, like workers, communities, and consumers, and enhance their human rights protection. The next line shows the human rights policies. These vary from no or no serious policy, a policy following external triggers only, a policy that considers respecting human rights as pivotal to its business model, that's an active approach, and a, polic and a policy where enhancing human rights protection is leading. That's the proactive company. Finally, we can look at the various possible roles of legal in this respect, the legal department. It can be in instrumental to resist change, which is a feature of the inactive company. It can assist in adapting to unavoidable change. Things have to change because of external factors, and the legal department is instrumental in assisting uh, that change. But legal can also be actively involved in shaping and implementing human rights policies, either to do no harm as an active policy um, feature or to do good to others as a proactive policy feature. These phases each have their challenges and dilemmas. They also come with different costs, obviously. An inactive approach might be cheaper in the short term, whereas an active or proactive approach might be cheaper in the long run. There may, also, there may also be different effects for the company's reputation. And it may be that parts of the company are moving towards an active or proactive phase, whilst other parts, perhaps for example legal, are still in the inactive or reactive phase. A good example is Unilever. Unilever is the first company to report on its implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights that were um, issued in 2011, which I mentioned earlier. Such a policy of a major company is very important um, because active uh, and proactive human rights policies cannot do without transparency. 
but it also shows the major challenges and the many dilemmas to implement these principles as a big company. Human rights ambitions of Unilever are not just a sign on the wall, but a policy that its CEO, Paul Polman, has taken on as his personal responsibility. This is an important indication for the sincerity of the human rights, company's human rights policy. It is courageous because it makes the face of the company vulnerable for criticism. It shows leadership. Such an approach also shows the challenges coming with an active or proactive human rights policy. One of the challenges is how far do you go with transparency? Where it is hard or impossible to be complete in a report like this, you need to indicate what sort of information you have left out. I began this lecture with the tea estates in Assam, where Unilever sources its Lipton tea. It is likely Unilever knew about this problem, but it didn't mention it in its human rights report. Asked by the media, Unilever explained this by saying it had limited the report to its top 200 suppliers. That's fair enough. But this limitation could have been mentioned in the report. The consequence was that Unilever was told off in the media, such this, as this week in the Dutch newspaper Financial Dagblad. Another example of a dilemma for Unilever's human rights report was the Indian case about mercury contamination in Kodakanal in India by one of Unilever's subsidiaries. Unilever denies liability for the damage caused. The case was recently brought back into the news by a clip of an Indian rapper going viral, 3 million views on YouTube. In a press release, Unilever clarified its position, but the statement made clear that the case was ongoing when the human rights report was drafted. This raises the question which role, if any, the legal department of Unilever played in deciding not to include this case in the report. As I said, learning organizations like Unilever need to be looked at differently than organizations that are willing, unwilling to learn. But the lesson that can be learned from these two examples is that transparency is great, but that being transparent about your transparency is better. Now, one may say that's all very well, but an active or proactive human rights report is, in fact, only an ethical, reputational, or strategic, strategic thing to do. It is not a legal thing to do. Let's briefly listen to um, John Ruggie, the former Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Business and Human Rights. He was asked, how can we bring morality back into business? That's unfortunate. Six times we tried it, six times it went well, and this is the seventh time, and um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Ruggie is telling a lot of interesting things, but we cannot really understand what he was saying. Well, his basic message, the question was, um, uh, how can we bring morality back into business, and he pointed out that human rights are an important element in that respect. And he said, what does human rights mean? Human, right, human rights mean treating people with dignity. And he says that's not only a moral issue, it is also a material issue for business. And I think it is also to a considerable extent a legal issue. So what are the legal reasons to adopt such an active or proactive human rights policy? First, the borders between soft law and hard law are fluent. Hard law is legal's responsibility, soft law is for CSR. Alternatively, sometimes it's said soft law is for the softies and hard law is for the tough guys. Of course, that's a false dichotomy. The distinction between hard law and soft law is fluid and they get more and more intertwined. For example, non-financial reporting obligations are increasingly connected with soft law guidance. Soft law is definitely a company lawyer's business if he wants to ensure that the company properly reports on its human rights policies. Second, 
Research shows that companies tend to overestimate their ability to appreciate, uh, to accurately predict the risks of stakeholder impacts. So they're not able to accurately assess the risks uh, that are posed to their stakeholders. It is therefore likely that company lawyers tend to incorrectly assess the level of re legal risk for the company. A more accurate estimation of the legal risk may be achieved by a company with an active or proactive human rights policy that engages in human rights due diligence and proper stakeholder meetings. This means complying with soft law obligations improves discovery, assessment, and management of legal risks. Three, conducting due diligence and stakeholder meetings enable the company to anticipate, prevent, and mitigate the consequences of disputes with workers, trade unions, and communities. The cost of due diligence and stakeholder meetings may be much smaller and often even a fraction of the operational losses caused by such disputes. Four, it is very likely that an active or proactive human rights policy following global soft law standards will anticipate the haphazard regulatory changes at the domestic and EU level over the next decade. Conversely, a reactive human rights approach means responding to these various piecemeal changes. They may, this may turn out to be more costly than investing in an active or proactive human rights policy and staying ahead of the game, or rather staying above the legislative waterline. Five, it's true that soft law is not enforceable in a court of law, but not complying with it increasingly carries other business risks, as I mentioned before, such as not being eligible for export credit guarantees, to participate in trade missions, losing out in procurement procedures, and becoming less attractive for banks and investors and running the risk of divestment. This process of banks and investors becoming more critical on human rights risks in their portfolios is monitored by uh, the Fair Finance Guide, a project of a consortium of NGOs including Amnesty International. They regularly publish data and rankings on how banks and other financial institutions invest their money. This enables consumers to decide about their own financial investments. Six, there's an inherent link between good governance and social impact. This is recognized in the Dutch Corporate Governance Code, which requires the company's supervisory board to have due regard for corporate social responsibility issues and for the relevant interests of the company's stakeholders. The code applies comply or explain principle Either the company includes information about compliance with the code in the annual report, or it explains why a code provision was not applied. Seven, soft law is a legal obligation. Since the adoption of the UN guiding principles in 2011, the company's responsibility to protect the human rights of workers, customers, and consumers is a legal obligation. A company lawyer or an external counsel from a law firm may argue this is a non-enforceable soft law obligation. If you don't comply, there's no problem because there will be no legal consequences, so you can get away with it. This defensive and calculating advice is typical for the human rights denying lawyer. It is advice that will land well in a company with an inactive or reactive human rights approach. Of course, such advice is not entirely uncommon in the legal world. Many company policies are designed to not or only minimally comply with hard law obligations as long as you know that there will be no real chance that you will run the risk of being caught. An active or proactive human rights approach means taking soft law seriously, embracing it and treating people, as John Ruggie said, with dignity, by respecting or even enhancing their human rights. This way the company doesn't only protect itself, but also its workers, customers, and communities. An active human rights policy requires the involvement and commitment of legal, and it requires an integrated approach throughout the company to avoid misalignment between the company departments. AXA Nobel is a good example. Around 2000, after a number of acquisitions and investments, the company was characterized by three different cultures three different ways of doing business. The then general counsel, Jan Eisbouts, 
saw that none of these cultures were keen to do business in an ethically correct way. This adversely affected the company's legal risks, and he took the initiative to draft and implement an extensive legal and ethical framework, including human rights issues. This process also changed, as he wrote, the role of the in-house lawyer in the company. The in-house counsel is no longer the te legal technician who will only give his specialist advice if and when requested by the business client based on the latter's assessment. A proactive posture, which includes timely notification by the lawyer of relevant developments in the legal field, should build a close relationship of trust between the client and the legal advisor that is needed to secure the legal integrity of the corporation in the interest of stakeholders and society at large. The legal account managers of the business units have been assigned an important role in ethical and legal compliance. Such a policy minimizes the risks of internal alignment and make legal and CSR and ethical policies work together. Another example concerns Spanish fashion chain Zara. This example is derived from a report of research organization SOMO. In 2011, 15 illegal immigrants were found working and living under deplorable conditions in two small workshops in Sao Paulo, Brazil. They had to work for up to 16 hours a day and were restricted in their freedom of movement. The government inspectors classified the conditions in the two workshops as analogous to slavery. The workshops were contracted by a supplier of Zara. According to the Brazilian authorities, Zara exercised directive power over the supply chain and could therefore be considered to be the real employer of the 15 immigrants at the workshop. The authorities therefore argued that Zara was legally responsible for the situation of the workers. Zara responded in two different ways to the findings of the Brazilian authorities. On one hand, it took progressive measures and assured its stakeholders and shareholders that it was able to effectively monitor its supply chain. Hence, it admitted that it was in control. At the same time, Zara denied legal liability. It argued that it had not authorized the outsourcing to this workshop, that Zara was not aware of the outsourcing, and that its contracting party had been deceiving audits. This means Zara told its shareholders that it was in control of its supply chain, but at the same time it was not legally liable because it was not in control of the supply chain. This is a typical two-way communication by a company that is inconsistent and therefore lacks credibility. Control is an important theme in the discussion about the legal liability of multinational corporations. Companies like to argue that they don't have control over their suppliers and they don't have control over their subsidiaries. However, the soft law and CSR practices show a different picture, as is also illustrated in the case above. The argument of lack of control is also at odds with the concept of global value chains. These chains are impossible to maintain and manage without a considerable amount of control by the lead company. Also in this respect, different legal approaches can be linked to the general human rights policy. The separate entity theory reflects an inactive or reactive human rights policy. An active human rights policy implies that the company accepts accountability for subsidiaries and suppliers, depending on the leverage and level of control. The proactive human rights policy considers subsidiaries and suppliers as a shared societal responsibility. The proof of the company's human rights policy is in how it deals with grievances and disputes. In case of a complaint, a company can deny, ignore, or belittle the allegations, thereby frustrating the complainant. As most complainants do not have the means to litigate, inactive companies often te are tempted to kill the complainant. Not the complainant, but the complaint. It's a well-known fact that inappropriate handling of complaints and grievances um, and not taking the complainant seriously creates the most fertile ground for an escalation of the conflict and for potential litigation. Provided the grievance mechanism uh, is a requirement, uh, sorry, the grievance mechanism is a requirement of the UN guiding principles. As John Ruggie wrote in his framework report, for a company it is important uh, to take a bet on winning lawsuits or successfully countering hostile campaigns is at best optimistic risk management. 
companies should identify and address grievances early before they escalate. An active, effective grievance mechanism is part of the corporate responsibility to respect. Therefore, a credible human rights policy requires a proper grievance or complaint mechanism. This means not a traditional customer services department response, for example, of a telecom provider or an airline that is designed to keep complainants at bay, to keep them in the queue or to fob them off. These, there are blunt as well as subtle and sophisticated complaint systems aimed at exhausting the complainant and let him drop the case. This is a typical approach of an inactive human rights policy. The grievance mechanism set up by a reactive company aims to channel complaints and deal with them in a defensive way. For the active company, the grievance mechanism serves as a risk information to run a learning process. Complaints are taken seriously and approached with an open mind and the mechanism is effective in solving the complainant's problem. The company's policy is based on objective and independent advice. A proactive company looks behind the complaint and aims to not only solve the complainant's problem, but also the underlying societal problems. To achieve this, a proper stakeholder and partnership policy is essential. It also requires a different approach from the company lawyer. He is no longer the advocate of the company alone, but he also needs to take the rights and interests of the complainant into consideration. This may require a new attitude. Lawyers are trained to prevent bad things from happening. They tend to focus on problems rather than on solutions. They learn to litigate and to fight. They learn to negotiate and to get a deal done. They are less proficient in solving problems and making good things happen. Because frankly, that's not their job. After all, the law hardly requires someone to do the right thing. It usually requires someone not to do the wrong thing. The salient example illustrates this point. Bodo is one of the heavily polluted areas in the Niger Delta in Nigeria. Since leakages in Bodo began in 2008, the area is predominantly black. Unlike in the Oruma case, which is the Dutch case that pens before the, uh, the Hague court, Shell had admitted liability for the pollution in Bodo. But the parties were unable to reach an agreement over how the area should be cleaned. The then Dutch ambassador to Nigeria, Bert Ronhaar, took up the role of mediator between Shell and the local population. However, no progress was being made for a considerable time. As Ambassador Ronhaar observed, the parties were out outright hostile against each other. Then he decided to ask the parties to negotiate without their lawyers. That was the breakthrough. Negotiations got on their way, trust between the parties was established, and they came to a solid agreement about the cleanup of the area. So the aim is to train lawyers that they see the solution rather than the problem. And not a solution for the company only, but for the company and the complainant, and preferably for society. Working as a lawyer at the Rotterdam School of Management gives me the opportunity to initiate and cooperate in a wider research agenda, such as in quantitative research projects. One of these joint projects uh, with staff of the school is a database of multinational companies that have been involved in human rights lawsuits, which we can link with a variety of other data, particularly company characteristics like the industry sector, the type of company, a listed company, family company, the country where the violation took place, the reporting system, the company model, shareholder model, stakeholder model, the management system, etc. One of the aims is to find out what specific company characteristics imply for the way companies are responding to lawsuits and what this implies for the position of the company compared to its peer companies and the whole economy. More particularly, we look at how the start and the termination of a lawsuit impacts on the corporate position on the stock market. Starting from a big sample of documented lawsuit cases by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center and a selected reading of the literature, we selected 74 lawsuits um, concerning severe human rights violations involving 54 publicly quoted multinationals. 
the period is 1950s until the present. And let me give um, you a first quick look at the results of that research project. First, the location of the uh, human rights violations. Mainly, but not solely, they are in the global south. South America, Africa, the Middle East, South and Southeast Asia. One remarkable point, a strong concentration of cases about violations in large developing countries. Did people in smaller countries find it more difficult to find a lawsuit? Or were human rights less violated there? Or were NGOs less present there? We may need to do additional research into the correlation between business human rights violations and the size of the country. The industry distribution, as we expected, we found a strong concentration of cases in metals, mining, oil, and gas, the extractives. However, and this may be a bit surprising for some, we also found an increasing number of cases in technology, pharmaceuticals, and the automotive industry. Corporate nationalities. Where were the seats, the headquarters? Lawyers talk about seats and in business um, studies they talk about headquarters, um, just that you know. Um, so where was the headquarters of the company that was sued? This slide shows that the majority of cases involve American and other Anglo-Saxon companies. They represent almost 75% of the cases. In these countries, the possibilities for litigation are usually better. There are active law firms with a strong business model to represent claimants from developing countries only. And in these countries, litigation is also much more embedded in the national culture. Also, litigation is partly initiated because of the public attention that is generated towards the sued company. And the litigation culture means that the companies are inclined to have a more reactive and defen defensive approach. Then we selected cases to look at the impact of what I already mentioned, the start and the termination of lawsuits on the company's share prices. We compare this with the general trend on the stock market, um, as noted in the Standards & Poor Index, and the sample of peer companies. Let me show you one example. Let me remind you at this stage of my experience in Uppsala in Sweden and the language they spoke, which I had troubles to understand. So to all my lawyer friends in the room, I'm with you when you don't get the picture at first sight and to start to slowly slide down your chair. The slide is about oil multinational Chevron. It was faced with two lawsuits, one in Nigeria and one in Ecuador. Both lawsuits started in the early 2000s and continued for quite a long time. Both were finalized in out-of-court settlements, and from the point of view of the legal department, this may have been a positive, successful result. Also because the court didn't get a chance to set a precedent. However, if you look at closely at the graph, the conclusion from a strategic point of view might not be that positive. You see a dark blue, a light blue, and a gray line. Look at the light blue line. This indicates the development of the share prices of Chevron over the 2000-2015 period. Now compare it to the dark blue line, which shows how the industry on average performed on the stock market over the same period. Then you see that the lawsuits may have had a serious effect on Chevron's reputation, and this conclusion is corroborated by the finding that the company score is relatively the same as the whole Standards & Poor Index, that's the gray line. So a success of the legal department may not be that positive for the company as a whole. This is just one example, but we have, of course, accumulated more. So yes, there are more biscuits in the tin, but I will adhere to the best of Dutch traditions, just one biscuit at a time, and firmly close the tin for now. The Erasmus team and I will continue to further develop this part of the research. Working as a lawyer, the Department of Business Society Management provides a good frame to create relevant insights into the area of international business and human rights. The resulting database will become available to scholars and will hopefully trigger additional research on the interface between law and business studies. At the end of this lecture, I would like to make some remarks on the bigger picture. 
In business and human rights, we often talk about problems that are micro manifestations of macro failures. In other words, many of the problems we face in business and human rights are a manifestation of the way the world is organized economically and politically. Let me say a few words on the situation of business and human rights in the Western world and then on the relationship between the state and the corporate world, which can be both a threat and an opportunity for business and human rights. Human rights are also under pressure in the, in the Western world. The erosion of human rights is a global development under the influence of deregulation, privatization, and reduction of the state. We see an increasing poverty gap, a shrinking middle class, a growing lower class, and workers seeing their security lowered and their precarity increased. Growing poverty means that cheap clothes from many Western people are not a luxury anymore, but a necessity. Cheap clothes that are mainly produced in, in, in Asia under doubtful labor conditions, including child labor. The cynical result is that the poorest people in Asia make it possible for the poorest people in the West to make ends meet and buy clothes. A few words about the cozy link between the corporate world and governments, which is, I think, also of growing concern in the area of international business and human rights. Problematic situations for human rights occur where corporations and states pursue the same aim to the detriment of individuals. I mentioned a few examples. Climate change, the influence of the corporate lobby on the national states, sorry, the corruption, the first topic. Upper left, House of Commons in England. The influence of the corporate lobby on the national states and the European Union is of considerable concern. Big money is getting increasingly hold of politics, most openly in the United States and the United Kingdom. Would this happen in the developing world? We would call it corruption. In the Western world, we call it democracy. Climate change measures, upper right, are not taking off because the national governments are giving in to industry's lobbies. The recent Urgenda case, in which a Dutch court ordered the state to do more to combat climate change, was to a great extent based on human rights legislation. The case demonstrates the pivotal role of the judge in enforcing human rights. In fact, the court is the only place where such a pact between the state and the corporate world can be broken. Third, the Groningen earthquakes were caused by the NAM, a company owned by Shell and Exxon, but in which the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs plays an influential role. The NAM and the ministry completely failed to respect the rights to life, to private life, and to home of the people of Groningen. Fourth, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership between the EU and the US, may also adversely affect the protection of human rights. Whilst the corporate world is given the opportunity to influence the negotiations, European parliaments and citizens are kept at bay. A strong civil society movement is now acting as a countervailing power, but the outcome remains uncertain. And then the refugee crisis. Yesterday, the Erasmus University created a temporary home for 200 refugees on this campus. A great act of charity by the university community. And perhaps there are even one or two of them here in the room. Also this week, in the midst of this major refugee crisis, London hosted one of the world's biggest weapon fairs. The Western weapon industry, endorsed by the national governments, earns billions of euros in conflict zones and fragile states and particularly in the countries from where now millions of people flee, looking for safety and sanity in Europe. And let's not forget that the most desperate people are probably not able to flee. In short, the human rights of many individuals are often crushed in the cozy relationship between the states and corporates. This pact provides for a grim picture. However, cooperation between the state and the corporate world is not only a problem and a threat, it also provides opportunities to enhance, to protect human rights, protection. So let me balance this grim picture by a few more upbeat observations on the positive role businesses can play to protect human rights, together with the state. Many human rights projects in the developing world are carried out in close cooperation, public-private partnerships between the state, companies, and civil society. Facilitating this often complicated and challenging cooperation is precisely what the Partnership Resource Center here at the Rotterdam School of Management does. 
Second, the relationship between business and states can be less cozy if states stand in the way of businesses that aim to respect and enhance human rights. As we saw in the case of India tea estates, the local government is not very helpful in tackling the problems on the estates. Indeed, many people living in conflict zones, fragile states and corrupt states, who have been left alone by their failing governments, may put their hopes on Western companies that are courageous enough to operate in a difficult environment and at the same time conducting an active human rights policy. Finally, not only citizens, also a growing number of responsible businesses is adversely affected by the power play of states and corporate lobby. Indeed, it is unlikely that the corporate lobby reflects the diversity of its constituency. Where the corporate lobby usually argues for no regulation in the area of business and human rights, responsible businesses with an active or proactive human rights policy may very well welcome regulation to level the playing field. What does this diverse picture mean for business and human rights? It means that we can and need to fight the micro-manifestations of human rights violations, but that we no must not lose sight of the bigger picture of the macro-economic and political failures. It is also relevant to look at whether companies and their legal departments work to benefit from these macro failures and, for example, lobby against human rights legislation. Other companies and their legal departments may want to make a difference, row it against the tide and correct the micro manifestations of macro failures by enhancing human rights protection for their workers, customers and communities. Mr. Director Magnificus, dames and heren, ladies and gentlemen, with my appointment on this special chair, I'm back indeed at my university where I started my academic life as a law student many years ago. It goes without saying that I'm most honored with my appointment and I would like to thank a number of persons and organizations for their commitment to establish this chair and to further my appointment. First of all, I thank the chair sponsors, Amnesty International, the Netherlands, and its director, Eduard Nazarski, and the Stichting Vredeswetenschappen, the Foundation for Peace Sciences, and its chair, Professor Jaap de Wilde. I also thank the boards of the Europe, Erasmus University and the Rotterdam School of Management for providing an academic home for this special chair. I'm also most grateful to those who have been instrumental in establishing and supporting this chair. Professor Stefan de Velde, Dean of the Rotterdam School of Management, Professor George Yip, the former Dean of the RSM and now Professor of Management at the China Europe International Business School in London and Shanghai. Gemma Kreins, formerly Manager of the Partnership Resource Center, which I mentioned, and also formerly in Amnesty International, who brought the two organizations together. The Business Society Management Department at RSM, particularly its chair, Professor Lucas Meis, the members of the selection committee, chaired by Professor Slavik Magala. Helene Timersma, formerly Amnesty International and now research associate to the chair. And Elena Osmocescu, research assistant to the chair, who both have been incredibly helpful over the past year. I'm particularly grateful to Elena, who provided the slides for the database research project and much of the underlying research. And last but not least, my colleague Rob van Tulder, founding father of the Business Society Management Department. Thank you so much, Rob, for paving my way into the department and the school and for our most inspiring discussions on business and human rights from different angles. I'm beginning to understand your language and I think I quite like it. This is a research chair, which means that I don't see many students, although today I'm welcoming I'm privileged to welcome one of my students from uh, London, from King's College, where I teach business and human rights, and also some 40 students who are traditionally at the back of this room from RSM. Let me assure you and your fellow students that I'm uh, delighted, I would be delighted to meet you to discuss the topic of international business and human rights. One of our most precious human rights is the right to family life. I feel privileged to enjoy a wonderful family life in the broadest sense of the word. My husband, Reinhard Hesper, 
for more than words can say, would I like to thank him and for having me on his side for almost 25 years. I thank my parents for the way they have raised me and my siblings with love, understanding, and a great awareness of the need to do in life what is fair and just. Much to my regret, my father didn't live to see this day, and my mother is not able to attend due to her advanced age, although this didn't prevent her from asking critical questions about what I was going to say today. And finally, I thank my brothers and sisters, both from the warm and the cold side, who have now sit through my third inaugural lecture and still refuse to take me too seriously most of the time. Ladies and gentlemen, dames and heren, ik heb gezegd.